This is The Crucible, the JRTC experience. This is Sappers Up, Into the Breach. In this series, we discuss engineer warfighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large-scale combat operations at JRTC. Hello, I'm Major David Beal, the Executive Officer for Task Force 5 here at the Joint Readiness Training Center. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Crucible, the JRTC Experience. Today, we're joined by Colonel Cleet Getz, the 100th Commandant of the U.S. Army Engineer School, and Sergeant Major Zach Plummer, the Regimental Sergeant Major. Um, sir, Sergeant Major, before we get into the meat of what we're going to talk today, can you share a little bit about yourself and, and your background with the audience? Yeah, sure, Dave. Thanks for having us here this morning. I'm excited to be able to do this. Uh, I've been fortunate to do a lot of different things in my career. The Engineer Regiment gives you a lot of opportunities. I've been able to take advantage of, of many of them. Uh, I've been a commander at brigade, battalion, and company levels uh, at Fort Cavazos as a brigade commander. I was a battalion commander in Europe. I was a company commander at Fort Drum. Uh, have got a little bit of time with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, three, three tours deep inside the, the Pentagon, uh, and then a couple other places. It's just been a great, uh, it's been a great ride for me and my family. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, sir. Sure, um, I appreciate that, Sergeant Major. Sir, good morning. So, I was in wheeled units, striker units, uh, mechanized units, airborne community, special operations community, battalion in Germany, brigade at JBLM, and now at the schoolhouse. So pretty wide stretch across the regiment, sir. Yeah, it sounds like an awesome breadth of experience, our major, kind of drawn from all those backgrounds. Um, I, I understand as a young officer, sir, your first rotation was a platoon leader with the 20th Engineer Brigade. Um, and then Sergeant Major, uh, squad leader with uh, 1st Brigade, 25th Infantry Division uh, down here at JRTC. I know that was only a couple years ago, but what memorable lessons did you guys learn during that first rotation? And um, how has that helped you throughout your military career? Yeah, I was, so I was, I was a PL. It was actually my second platoon. Um, and, and going into this, as young platoon leader at then Fort Bragg, I felt felt pretty confident about myself. You know, I'd been to a couple schools, was a jump master, uh, felt like I'd been around the block uh, as, as a leader, and then, uh, and then got down here and, and really realized how hard th this business yeah. is. Um, and just the, the unrelenting nature of a JRTC rotation where you, you couldn't just be thinking about the job you were doing then. As a leader, I had to think about what we were doing 24 and 48 hours, mm -hmm. dealing with fatigue, uh, mental fatigue, physical fatigue. So I came out of there uh, really humbled by the experience and with a greater understanding of what I needed to put into myself and what I needed the unit to do to really have an expectation to be successful in combat. It was, it was very, very difficult. Um, it, there was a lot, say there was a lot of growing and, uh, yep. and I was, I was better for it, but I came out of there think going in thinking, yeah, I'm ready. And I came out of there thinking I'm not as ready as I thought I was. Um, and, I, and I'm glad I got that. Yeah, it's, that's typical, sir. We see that a lot of young leaders as they come here. Um, and every position is a little different, so it's good to pull those lessons and, and pull them forward. Uh, Sergeant Major, your sir. experience? So it was kind of it was a tough transition. So coming out of Korea, mechanized world, then going to JBLM with 125, getting ready to deploy to Iraq. This was our rotation before we left. So changing from mechanized to striker, and then come into an organization that has been built together for months and here I am a new squad leader. So when it, it taught me, you know, building your team, it taught me how uh, rehearsals are key, but not only just rehearsals here, it's, it's that also that, how are you integrating your home station training? How are you doing your sergeant's time? How do you get to all of those uh, basic fundamentals to a mastery level at the unit before you come to a CTC rotation where it's it's game day prior to deployment. So, Sorry, Major, I, I think that's great insight, right? Part of what we do here is we try to train units, you know, for their toughest day in combat. So, you know, that train up before going to 
going to Iraq and before that deployment experience. Um, hopefully, we're able to prepare you to, to be successful during that time. And also, as that unit started changing, something we're going to touch on here shortly, right, as we see that change across the Army, um, leading at the squad leader level, um, there'll probably be some good insight we can kind of pull as, as we continue discussing today. Um, so just... We're going to talk a little bit today about some of the changes in the Army, both on our force structure and a little bit uh, about how we breach and how we as engineers uh, approach the problem sets that we help the Army solve. Uh, so this is an interesting time uh, for transformation in the Army, both in the Army and, and the Engineer Regiment, uh, based on some of the force structure changes, uh, breaching methods of what we're seeing um, out of Ukraine and, and uh, the Gaza War. Um, changes to the brigade combat team, focusing, pulling elements out and focusing at division level. Here at JRTC, we help, to, we help the Army kind of learn and, and project some of these future problems. So this current rotation, we got 1st Brigade, uh, 82nd Airborne Division down here. Uh, we're doing two things specifically to, to help us. So first, the 127th Airborne Engineer Battalion is is pulled out of the brigade, they're fighting at division level. Um, that's going to help us kind of learn how to navigate that change in the future. Um, second, we're helping in conjunction with the 20th uh, test some autonomous breaching methods and, and ways to improve and modernize our, our breaching structure here. Um, so, Sir, Sir Major, there's a lot of change. Like we said, we're pulling out that those engineer battalions out of the brigades and put them at division level. What do you see as driving that change? Um, and, and why do you think it's important? So I, I think the fundamental driver of this change is, is the Army going to the division uh, as a unit of action, right? And if you're going to make the division the unit of action, then you need to give the division commander some flexi flexibility in how they um, deploy the assets at their disposal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think pulling... So this move to pull engineers out of the brigade structure and up to the division level, I think, is a, is a nod to the fact that we have to do that for the division commanders. Um, and so with that, with that flexibility that you've given them, you know, it, it does create some demands on the leader. I think, um, whereas in a brigade now, you know, you've, you've got an engineer, lieutenant colonels, the principal advisors, the brigade commander on, on engineering matters. Um, obviously very, very experienced. You know, what you're gonna have in, in the future in, in the light divisions uh, is you're gonna have an engineer company commander who is that chief advisor on engineering matters, you know, to that brigade commander. It's gonna create, a de they're gonna create some demands to develop expertise younger, right? It's gonna create some demands on that battalion commander um, to, to teach, coach, and mentor more um, so that they can impart that, that experience and some of that knowledge down to that company commander who's going to be living there day to day, you know, with that BCT, you know, as they operate. And then I think the, the third thing, you know, it, it is, I think it's very different supporting a unit that you're organic to and, and another matter altogether to support a unit that you might be attached opcom take on to. Um, and so, as always, the currency in the Army tends to be relationships. Uh, it's going to put a premium on young leaders being able to walk into uh, a new organization with with confidence, build relationships, establish trust. Uh, I think the most important thing, and be able to you know succinctly explain to the supported unit what it is that that they can provide and have a sense of what the commander wants to accomplish and then how what you bring to the table helps them do what it is that, that they want to do. Uh, we've done this before. Uh, those skills are out there and, and I have nothing if not a, a lot of faith uh, in the abilities of, of our leaders out there to be able to adapt to this. Yeah, sir. I I think that was some great insight. And, and one thing that we see every single rotation here is those compo two and three units that again are not organic, right? So as they come in and they build those relationships and, and bring that skill and knowledge, uh, those young leaders providing their, hey, here's my capabilities brief to that unit and that unit receiving that. Um, I think that's something we'll see here in the future too. Yeah, that, so that that's part of it. You know, what, I, what I tell platoon leaders, especially that are getting, lieutenants especially that are getting going to this, Right. When, imagine you're walking into the task force talk the first time uh, and someone's like, hey, who are you and what can you do to do for me? Mm -hmm. And if your answer is, hey, I got, you know, I got so many light vehicles, I got so many trucks, I got so many picket pounders, you're, you're lost. Right. What you got to be able to do is express your capability, you mm -hmm. know. 
hey, sir, ma'am, in 24 hours, if you tell me to do it, like, this is this is what I can give you. This is the capability that I can put into the ground and the capability that my platoon or company has. And so they have to get comfortable speaking, not in terms of stuff, but in terms of outcomes that they can generate for the supported force, right? And so that's that next level. And you probably need to be able to do that in, in 15 to 30 seconds. Um, you know, by all means, if you can sit down and hash over PowerPoint and field, hey, more, more power to you, suggest you might do other things with your time. Uh, but but you got to be able to very succinctly explain, this is what I can do if you can tell me to do it. And then you got to deliver over and over again. You got to deliver. And then that builds the trust. Definitely, sir. It, as we prepare these young leaders, both you know, at NCOES schools and, and officer PME, right, like how can we do that within the force to make our engineer leaders able to integrate quickly and succinctly with those supported maneuver formations? I, I think for us, and I'll turn it over to, to Sergeant Major, um, we're going ha- to have to change some of how we train at, at the schoolhouse. So we're going to have to uh, build those scenarios in where they have to go and deal with some someone who is not an engineer and put them in those situations uh, where they have to do what, what I just described, right? Uh, get, get them the reps young, give them the feedback young, and then just completely do it over and over and over again is, is what I think. Yeah. So I think as you look at the force structure, you know, we're talking about where your headquarters is going to be. But for the, the leaders in the field, the ones that are going to be executing the missions, our missions haven't changed. Mobility, counter mobility, survivability, how we do that in the future will change. But those core uh, tasks still exist, right? And so as we move into the PME realm, we really need to reinforce, especially with the NCOs, that you also have to be the one to know how to sell the engineer capabilities and what you can do for your squad or platoon. Because as we break down your your squad or your platoon may be working all by themselves attached to pick a unit and but they also have to be able to convey what they can do for that force um you know and, and i'm excited to see how we continue to evolve and change to see what new technologies we can come up with and, and how we can train differently through pme i mean when, mm-hmm. when you think about it you know you talk about the, the diffusion of, of engineers throughout i mean you're exactly right it is probably going to be an engineer staff sergeant with with that maneuver company commander that has to have the same comfort in, in explaining what they can do and plan and deliver as well. It's going to put a premium, I think, on, on leader development um, in, uh, in time at PME. Was, yeah. That's exactly what happened to us when I came through as a squad leader. It was Staff Sergeant Plumber and Company Commander of Alpha Company 124. So understanding that and being able to perform in that environment is going to be key. Yeah. I, I, 100% agree with that, Sergeant Major, right? Like I, something I've discussed with leaders throughout the years, is this isn't a new thing, no. right? When I was in the 326th Engineer Battalion at, at Fort Campbell, right, we look back to our history in supporting Rock in 2001, right? And they deployed as an independent company mm-hmm. in support of that maneuver task force, and those leaders had to do those mission sets. So this is not something new. I know you've seen some of this, and you've lived through some of this in the past, um, but it, it's exciting to kind of come back to that and see our leaders step up to that to that plate. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I've realized when, when I go out and I talk to, to engineers across the force, and it's comforting to me is, you know, qualitatively, we, we are really good. Um, the platoon leaders now are better than I was as a platoon leader. The company commanders are better than I was um, as a company commander. Uh, on and on, we 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 are we are ready for this. This is new, uh, or this excuse me, this is not new. This is new to some, but we, we've seen this before. Uh, we have the we have the capability to do it. Um, leaders leaders need development um and then they need to they need to believe in themselves and, and put in the, the self-study self-development uh, to, to bring this to fruition i i lose no sleep at our ability to do this definitely sir i i 100 agree um 
as we look at this, there will be changes, though. So the opportunities that come up for uh, junior squad leader, platoon sergeants, and lieutenants, captains, majors, right, and those career paths that help them towards their future and towards their goal where they want to be at the end of their service to, to the Army and to the nation, like, it's going to be different. Um, so what, what advice would you give those young leaders as they start mapping out their futures? Yeah, I, I think that I'll give you a couple pieces of advice. Um, first, do, do what you like, right? Do what you enjoy doing in the Army. If you like it, you're, you're probably going to be good at it. And if you're good at it, it's good for you, it's good for the unit, um, you, you'll, you'll be happy. So f- follow your passion w- with, within the regiment in doing what it is you want to do in support of the Army. And, and I think you'll find some satisfaction there. The, the second thing, and this has not changed, is, is perform. The thing that determines whether or not you get opportunities in the Army is not, is not the organization structure it's it's your performance right so if you go out there and you perform you're going to get the opportunities that that you're that you're looking for um and that hasn't changed that ought to be comforting um that the the structure hasn't changed or excuse me the structure has changed but the 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 rule the ground rules of performance equals opportunity hasn't and just go out do what you love and do it well Definitely, sir. T- timeless advice. Sorry, Major. Sir, what, I'm, what I've seen lately is NCOs use DAPAM 625 as a checklist, yeah. right? Um, hey, you know, I've met the minimum time as a squad leader, a platoon sergeant X, and what's next for me? Um, whereas the DAPAM is more of a guide, right? So uh, current... Rev- um, the current edition is up with TRADOC for approval. When it comes out, it'll be 24 to 36 months is what, what's considered CD or KD complete. So that, that's a range. But what people aren't taking into consideration is how are they performing in these jobs before they go look for another one? Um, you know, you may have 36 months as a squad leader, but if all your NCOER say qualified, right, or not highly enumerated or poor bullet comments, then your performance isn't matching your time. Whereas you could have somebody on the opposite side where they only have 24 months, but have excelled greatly in that, in those positions. So that's probably time to move on. So understanding what the DAPAM is, how to use it, and more importantly, how do you, how do they teach their soldiers that are coming up what this means for them um, it is a big thing. You know, I went through my background and I would say if you if you stay in one type of organization in the engineer regiment, you're going to pigeonhole yourself as you as you move on later. As an example, um, you might be the number three best SAR major in a certain type of organization, Mm -hmm. but there's no positions for you. So if you stayed in this community your entire career and now all of a sudden there's nothing open for you, you now might be the 17th best SAR major to fit the organization that we're going to slot you against. So staying in one organization is not going to help. It's not going to get after what we talked about earlier about how do we understand the capabilities of the regiment uh, to make yourself a better leader and help out the regiment, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I'll I'll go back um, more, more specifically uh, so I've got DA PAM 600-3. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, the revisions on my desk, they're probably 95%. And we've got the, I just got to go through it one more time, make sure we're not creating any confusion in the force. And I don't want to confuse boards. Uh, we, we have uh, created some new KD opportunities for, for officers in, in the force, uh, primarily at the, at the majors level. You know, we, we looked at, are there other jobs as a captain uh, that could be KD besides company command. And, and I think that the only thing that is like company command is company command. Um, and that's such a key uh, experience in an officer's career that I'm not making any changes there. At, at the major level, though, that's where we begin to see some changes. So the, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at making some uh, start with some deputy district commander positions in USACE districts, um, K- KD. I, I think. Uh, those outside the, the regiment, certainly some outside of USACE, I think don't understand what it is we ask those majors to do in those districts. Um, they are they are XOs uh, and then some, and then they're dealing they're doing things like dealing with, say for example, union negotiations uh, that other folks maybe don't have to do. We're going to make those KD 
uh, geospatial planning cell OICs uh, are going to become KD. I feel we have to make a meaningful investment in geospatial uh, within the regiment to help the Army uh, reach its vision of, of what geospatial has to be to enable all these systems that are going to come into being for the Army of 2030 uh, in 2040. And then, you know, at the lieutenant colonel level, we are going to continue to be commanders as CSL 05s. Uh, we, we are a combat arms branch. Our leaders at that level are commanders. Um, but we have seen uh, some other opportunities present themselves. There are more opportunities within the Army Corps uh, of engineers. Uh, I think, I believe, I go back to quantitatively, there might be fewer opportunities. Qualitatively, we're as good as we have ever been, and I expect engineers to compete very well uh, for branch and material assignments. And uh, so those changes are, are on the cusp of being codified, and uh, I feel good. There are going to be opportunities out there. The opportunities will be there if we just perform. Ah, sir, it's exciting to see the change and, and those opportunities come come to fruition for, for leaders across the board. Um, so super excited to kind of see that as we grow uh, as a regiment. Um, mo moving on from the task organization, starting to look at how we modernize our, our breach effort uh, based on what we're seeing around the world and, and what we're seeing out of units here as they come and train at, at JRTC and other CTCs. So in addition to Devil Strike uh, 127, uh, their task organization under division, we've partnered with 20th Engineer Brigade um, in their efforts at modernizing our breach structure and our breach equipment. Uh, they're going to come down here. They're going to fire an, a Miklik autonomously this afternoon. I think we're going to have the opportunity to see that. I'm in. It'll be awesome to see. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the great things we can do down here. A lot of units can't do stuff like that at home station, but JRTC and the CTCs, we offer the opportunity for them to do those things um, offset. How do you see this effort led by 20th and uh, the regiment changing how our engineers approach the breach and the problem sets they're going to have to overcome in the future? Yeah. So first, Dave, I want to I want to thank the, the the COGS and the CGs of the training centers out there who have been so open to, to experimentation um, because we would not be where, where we are without their willingness to support the direction that we think we need to go. And so first, thank you to all them for allowing us to do this. Um, I, here's how I think, here's how I think this, this plays in. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at Ukraine, we're learning from the experiences um, in Ukraine. And we're also contemplating what changes in technology are out there that can help us do this very, very dangerous operation of breaching as close to bloodlessly as we, as we can possibly do it. Um, when you look at the way we breach now, um, probably here at JRTC, you're probably still seeing guys using grappling hooks, right? <laughs> I mean, every, every, yeah. time I, every time I see one of those, um, you know, I die a little bit inside because uh, the, the technology is, is out there now in, in APOBs, for example, to, to, let us, to let us do that with a little bit more standoff and a little bit less risk of, of loss of life. The, the thing that's going, what Sandhills is going to, has done for us and is going to do for us is it gives us a sense of what is in the realm of the possible technologically now in a few years from now uh, that we could use to inform the technology that we're developing. Uh, you know, we've got a replacement for the Miklik in, in the works. This work by Sandhills um, has been really, really enlightening as to what else is out there. Because when, you know, you, you think about what this has the potential to change, if, if you're Instead of two, instead of two lanes in a task force, because that's all you have the ability to, to, to put in. What if we augment you um, technologically instead of going to starting with two and hoping you get to, you start with six and maybe you find three that are going really well, um, and you can wait those three. And in doing so, you can create options for the maneuver commander. Um, you can avoid to the extent that you can, uh, injury and loss of life for us, you can preserve some, some combat power. Um, and so the stuff that the 20th engineer brigade has been doing under, you know, Colonel Hurley, uh, has been really, really incredible. I've been, uh, very, uh, 
there's been a very enthusiastic reception of what he's been doing within Dev, uh, DevCom, uh, the Engineering Research and Development Center. Everyone is on board and, and sees the value here, uh, and, and we are absolutely getting something out of this. Definitely, sir. And you mentioned specifically those those sappers in the breach, right? So one thing we coach here at JRTC and, and SAR Major, this is probably first to you, is that we coach breaching fundamentals with everything we do, right? How do we suppress, obscure, secure, reduce, and assault to, to get sappers through the breach to create options for the commander uh, like you just outlined, sir? So like, how do you see that change in the future off of some of these efforts? It, it, or do we not see that change? It will be the same. Sir, it, it has to change right so what it's really making us do is think not just the, at the point of the breach the sapper on the ground how those breaching fundamentals come into play you now have to look across the whole spectrum uh, of mdo and so how are we suppressing drones it may not be an engineer function but across the the total forces how how are we going into this breach point on the ground with the the best likely of success so if we continue to look at these fundamentals just from the sappers and the breach perspective, it's going to be a difficult time. We've got to understand that at every different domain, how are we doing all of these things to get that breach open so the maneuver commander can do what they've got to do? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And we see that again, we'll, we'll come back to breach in a second, but you just, you know, key to another topic, right? So we coach obscuration we coach getting command posts into the wood line right because we are always observed in everything we do um, and how we camouflage and how we protect our forces um, so like that's also a part of this i feel like how do we protect ourselves from drones and those additional national platforms that our enemies will increasingly have during large-scale combat operations um, and then how we see it in the future if, if that makes sense yes, sir so I hate to say the, you know, what I remember, uh, the battle space has changed immensely from when I was growing up. But some of those basic fundamentals of camouflaging, maneuvering, not staying in one place, digging foxholes, right? We can't be stagnant to the point of like, we, we can only be here. We've already started seeing the reductions in the mega tox or the mega CPs. Um, you know, in in Germany, for example, we went from a three or five drash system CP down to an LMTV trailer, mm -hmm. right? How are we now going back and teaching how to be mobile? How are we teaching some of the redundancies so that if we are in a, a digital constrained environment, how are we doing our map boards to go back to um, being able to still continue this? We've, we've got to get away from, I need everything and everything with me right here where I am uh, and really get into letting leaders at Echelon do what they are trained to do. Definitely. I 100% agree, right? Leveraging those leaders and, and having them come in with confidence to execute that mission set, um, incredibly important um, in any future conflict or any future uh, fight that we get into as we go across. Um, sir, 20th Engineer Brigade, they're, they're doing some awesome work here, kind of helping us modernize and, and learn lessons from what we're seeing across the world here. I know at the individual level, like there are young leaders out there that want to make an effort and want to make a change and, and want to contribute, you know, what they need to see and, and how they think we can do it better. How do we get those junior engineer leaders, whether they be young NCOs who are bringing some awesome knowledge or a platoon leader or captain just out of, out of schooling that has some thought or even compo two, compo three who are pulling from their, their day job basically to, to contribute how do we get those junior leaders tied in with the regiment so one of the, one of the things i feel really good about uh, in the engineer regiment is we've got uh i think a pretty vibrant dialogue in the regiment where we come together and we can we can talk to each other so tomorrow as a matter of fact uh, i'm going to sit uh, what's called the regimental lessons learned form. Um, we do it. We do it twice a year. It's primarily focused on uh, company grade leaders from from all components, sharing what it is that that they have learned uh, in training or or at CTC rotations. Um, and originally, when I originally started it, I I kind of wanted to make it a discussion between the leader uh, and their OCT. You know, talking about a pivotal pivotal moment 
in their rotation um, where where some learning took place, right? And so that they could they could discuss that, hopefully share it with, with the population, so you wouldn't have to have that discussion again yeah. uh, in uh, in in the same in the same form. So so you got that. Um, we've got the All Things Regiment series uh, where we talk about uh, some some bigger issues for the regiment. We've got Engineer Magazine mm-hmm. uh, that's out there. We've got the uh, we've got the essay on the Engineer Professional Journal. Excuse me, that's published um, one, once a year. What what I so what I need junior leaders to do is don't don't be intimidated thinking that the thing that you want to talk about is not worth talking about because I guarantee you that you're not the only person that has got that on their mind. Um, have have the courage to put your idea out there and put it in writing, uh, so that so that we can talk about it. Um, and then we give you the we've got those forms at the regimental level. I know those forms are going on at the unit level uh, in in leader leader professional development sessions. You know across the regiment and, and across the army. But write. Don't be afraid to write. Uh, if you got something for the regimental lesson learned form, bring it up, bring it to Office of the Chief Engineer's attention, bring it to the schoolhouse's attention, uh, and we'll throw it out there and we'll start chewing on it as a regiment. Definitely, sir. Sergeant Major, any, any thoughts from NCO side? How do we get those junior leaders talking across the force? It's it's always been a question because you don't often see uh, NCOs write articles for, for all the things Colonel Guest just, yeah. just brought up. Um but first, Sergeant Ansong wrote an article, and I, I think it, I can't remember, sir, if it was the Blast or if it was the uh, Engineer Professional Engineer. Journal. Well, yeah. So, yep. fantastic article. And so, you know, you talk about writing for NCOs, and they're like, no, I'm, I'm good. But it's sharing those across the, the their peer group, but also knowing that they have a voice. And if they ever wonder why all of these platforms that we just mentioned are very officer centric is because we don't have NCO participation, right? It's open to everybody. You want to write an article, you want to discuss a topic, hey, send me an email saying, hey, in the next lessons learned form, I want to talk about X, Y, or Z. Um, when we do the uh, rally point in April, we're talking all about just NCO issues. We're going to have um, uh, Chief Gadsden as well talk about some of the warrant officer things, you know, ask EM cycles, what's the myth and confusion about OMLs, uh, and and there's a few other topics in there. I'm going to leave those ones for kind of a surprise. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, just participate in, in what we're offering as a regiment to talk about because we're not just talking officers. We're not talking warrant officers. No, we're not talking about NCOs. We're talking a regiment as a whole. So unless we get participation from everybody involved, um, it, it becomes very one-sided conversation. But when we have people pop up and say, hey, what about X, Y, and Z, we address and we would like to talk about them. I, yeah. I, I, I would love have nothing more um, than to spend more time talking about uh, topics that matter to our non-commissioned officers and, and junior enlisted soldiers. Right? They're 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 the heart of the force. Um, I would love to talk, but just come out of hide. We want to hear from you. Uh, what's going on in your life? What do you think? And, and I failed to mention. Sergeant Major brought it up. Another way you can communicate. Every other month, the Army Engineer Association hosts what they call a rally point. Uh, it, it's an online engineer TED Talk, if you will. Uh, next one's in April on the topics that Sergeant Major discussed. And uh, if you're interested and you want to sign up, just go to the, the Army Engineer Association website, register, and, and you're good. Come join join the conversation. Definitely, sir. And and also in April, something I remember as a young lieutenant, because um, I was in career course at the time, right? We got Engineer Regimental Week. Yeah. And it was great get, going out there, doing the run, getting sprayed with the, the hose off the fire truck. Yep. Right? And just in learning as a, as a junior leader, um, because I do, I went to 10th Mountain um, right after and we deployed straight to Afghanistan. There was an E7 who was graduating from Sapper School at the Engineer Ball in the same unit I went to. Um, and it was great seeing him and having that first introduction across the force. Um, so I know that's another opportunity that's coming up shortly, uh, regimental week in, in April. Oh, it is It is in our windshield. Um, I tell you, it's one thing to, it's one thing to go to it. Uh, it's another thing to plan it and live it. <laughs> uh, but man, it, it, is, uh, it, it, is, it is fun. 
Uh, it is exhausting, but uh, this this year, this week is going to be awesome. Yeah. April's coming fast and it's getting busy. You know, we've got the best mapper competition going on, followed by the geospatial engineer working group followed by the best sapper competition straight into engine engineer week with ffe end tape um we're doing a home on home uh conference if you will um and, and all the events you just listed as well sir you know the, the fallen sapper memorial the run um we're we're determined to do a run this year the last two years it's been canceled yeah. for weather um just all the great events going into this and, and uh, if i didn't mention it end tape on the end um so it's getting busy april's going to be a great month um it's great to see that what we've known as engineer week really has kind of grown to april is engineer <laughs> month um but it, it, it's a great time and i if people can come out for it it, it it's absolutely worthwhile. Awesome. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Thank you, sir. Um, as we transition from, you know, some of those lessons learned and, and discussions that we've had on force structure and, and breaching uh, methods for the future, uh, you both have a long time in the Army and, and lots of time leading formations through change, uh, both technologically, like we were talking about for the breaching, and uh, force structure manual related, like we talked about um, with how we're changing the force. What advice would you have for junior leaders at the company and platoon level as they explain this this to their subordinates and how they lead those formations through whatever changes they happen to be coming so, into? So, I mean, I'll go back. I'll go back to where I started on, on the importance of performance. But uh, several several months ago, I was in the Pentagon. I was talking to uh, you know to someone on the, the Army staff. This is a successful officer. So an officer is going to be a division commander here pretty soon. He's an armor officer. Um, and we were talking about this, and he said, you know, when I was a, uh, I was a tank company commander, um, and as a tank company commander, all I ever wanted to be was a tank battalion commander because that was the thing that we wanted to be. And, he, you know, and in the years that went by, you know, when he got to be a battalion commander, tank battalions didn't exist anymore, right? They'd become combined arms battalions, right? And, and so instead of looking at this thing like, hey, someone, someone moved my cheese, my tank battalion's gone, um, he embraced the change. That, that the army uh, had implemented. But more importantly, you know, what he said was the, the thing that preserved my ability to take advantage of those opportunities was my performance, right? So it didn't, it wouldn't matter if there were tank battalions or not anymore if I didn't perform and he performed, he did well. And, he, and you know, and he talks about, just think about how the air defense artillery branch is, is fundamentally changing and how important that that has become again the realization that if we, if we don't do something about it it's going to do a lot of damage to the army right mm -hmm. Th those officers who are taking those positions of leadership now 10 years ago um might have looked at their branch differently but said I, there will be opportunities there if i perform the, the same thing will be for the engineer regiment for platoon leaders and company commanders now um you don't know what's going to be out there for you as opportunities 10, 15 years from now, but but you can absolutely control through your performance what opportunities you're going to be given. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's it's going to be good. If if you love the army, uh, and you perform, you're going to be fine. Definitely, sir. Sorry, major. So I'll, I'll keep it more training. Um, is you know we, we've talked how. Mm -hmm. Various units do different things. They have different roles uh, depending on the type of the unit. So, but what doesn't change is our our mission, our tasks as an engineer. So, so too often we get focused on, hey, I'm in First Brigade 25th. Our our mission is to do X, and then we forget about all the other engineer tasks that we're required to know. Then we transition between units. So. 14th Engineer Battalion, Wheeled Battalion, started my career there. We focused on X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Go to the 44th in Korea. Now it's a completely different thing. Um, and we still have to, have to do all of those missions. Come back from Korea, now I'm in a you know, 73rd Engineer Company that's now Striker. So completely different mission sets for the Army, but the jobs that were asked us to, asked, the jobs we were asked to do didn't really change. Mm -hmm. um, but too often we get hyper-focused on what the unit we're currently in is telling me to do 
and those other skills fall by the wayside. So when that NCO now PCSs or that soldier becomes a non-commissioned officer, goes to be a team leader first time at a different job or a different unit they weren't in, they're lost because that wasn't a task that they trained on before. So how are we maintaining our tasks as engineers, regardless of the unit? And it's tough, right? So take 127th, they jump out of airplanes for for a living. That's how they get to the fight. They focus on different tasks and sets because of their mission. But what about the other things? So how do we find time through unit training management to make sure that we are still training all of the skills that we need to be successful as engineers? So when it comes time to hit the objective, we're not losing time. We're not losing lives because we didn't take the time to train the right way back at home station or in a CTC. Yeah, 100% agree, Sergeant Major, right? Like, we got 82nd. They jumped in last night, and we're going to watch them fight across the box. We've got 10th Mountain coming here in May. Uh, we had 101st Airborne Division did their long-range air assault back, back in January. Like Watching all these different divisions, the way they fight, they, they fight the same. It's just how they execute that JFE and get to the fight. Yeah. Um, that's different. So that that's a great lesson for any any junior leader. Um, at, before we close out, uh, just real quick, uh, you both have seen many many JRTC rotations from multiple levels and multiple positions in the past, right? And taking us back towards your first rotations um, with the 20th and with 25th ID, right? What would you tell, what's the one thing you would tell a leader prepare their formation, uh, their first CTC rotation to, to help them be successful as they get down here? So as you train up to come to a CTC, you're, you're validating your tax op, you're validating your battle drills, you're doing all that, which is great. Mm -hmm. But don't be stuck to it. When you come to a CTC and you get an inject or you get something that's not in your playbook, be adaptive. Realize what's going on and how it's going to change and adapt to the current situation, the current fight, the current enemy situation, whatever it is, and then go back and fix your SOPs, your tax ops, and your battle drills. But don't be beholden on the playbook that's sitting on a table in the talk or, you know, for the, the troops on the ground, know what the situation is, think outside of the box and execute. Yeah. For, for me, um, having, having done a couple of these and, and wa watched a lot of them, um, when I see engineers at the CTCs, e engineering is seldom the the problem, right? Proficiency at being an engineer, seldom the problem. It, what, what's funny is though, is that there's a lot of stuff on the periphery that if you're not able to do it, could just create a whole bunch of friction in your life and just make it different and make it yeah. difficult. So I think for example, um, out one time and, uh, in, in the radio dumped the fill, right? Well, okay. Just fill the radio. Um, if you're not good at that, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're running around look who's got the damn skl like what's the pin for this thing how do you know like all, all that um that adds friction to your life uh you know combat casualty care you know if you can't do it you know of a plan yeah, it just adds a lot of friction to your life if you can't do maintenance mm -hmm. in the field it's just a lot of friction in your life and instead of spending your time uh planning and rehearsing and executing engineer related tasks what you find is that your lunch is getting eaten by all the things that you take for granted and you didn't train but are, but are showing that, that you got to put a lot of work into and, and it all, you've only got 24 hours in a day. And so the more time you spend dealing with nitinoid issues that you didn't think were going to be an issue because someone else will take care of it, or just, you thought it magically happened. Um, nothing magically happens. Um, and so those things you think that are on the periphery, pay, pay some attention to them and be good at them so that when they surface, they are just peripheral issues that you just work your way through in a matter of minutes and it doesn't become some life altering event. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can focus on what it is you're supposed to do. Sir, that, that is an awesome, awesome piece of advice. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, the S3 of the unit that we're, that we got here right now. Right. And we we're talking how long it's going to take to put in a survivability position. Yeah. Right. He's like, it's going to take this long. And I'm like, that's great. Are they going to get there? Are they going to have the right radio? Are they going to know link-up procedures? And the exact conversation you just had, sir, like that's the exact 
what we're coaching here every single day. Um, so awesome advice. You two Sour Major That's for those. That's what their plan says. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. You can't plan off that that one time. Yeah. You've yeah. got to have the flexibility, like you said. Um, Sir Sour Major, before we close out, um, do you have any closing comments you want to share um, before we kind of close this out and move on? Yes, sir. So through my time, I've seen multiple transformations in the Army. And when the dust settled, we were we were just fine. We still executed. We still need a need, and uh, we still have the need for engineers. We still have the need for good performing and non commissioned officers, right? Yeah, some people might have some angst, a little turbulence in the force right now. But when it comes out on the other side, we are going to be a better, stronger regiment than before we started, sir. Yeah, yeah change change makes us all nervous that that's that's natural right um at the same time you, you can't wring your hands and roll up your sleeves at the same time you got to choose to do one or the other um the, i i choose for this regiment to roll up our sleeves and do this because you think about it we've been around since june 16th 1775 all right two days two days after the army came into being they realized they needed engineers there are always going to be engineers in the army but we look different thank god than we did in, in in 1775 but the fundamental nature of the regiment and what military engineers do our right, combat engineering general engineering geospatial engineering has not changed since 1775 we've always been asked to do those things the way that we do them has been in a constant state of change, all right? So the, the character of the regiment and how we provide those those capabilities to the Army has been constantly changing. Um, and, and here we are in another period of significant change, and that's okay. Again, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna be fine. I lose no sleep for the regiment. Our people are as good as they have ever been. Um, I am as confident in our abilities as I have ever been. Um, and if. And when we get to the other side of this, um, we're gonna look at ourselves and say, Man, that was a whole bunch of worry for, for nothing. We're good, just just perform. And I have complete faith in every leader and soldier out there that we're gonna be fine. So I appreciate this opportunity. This has been great, Dave. Um, doesn't take much to get me talking about the regiment. No. But, uh, and thanks for hosting yeah. us. Awesome. Thanks, Colonel Getz. Thanks, Colonel, or Sergeant Major Plummer. 100% uh, appreciate you guys coming and participating in the Crucible, JRGC experience with us. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your time here at JRGC. Always, always enjoy being down here. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on the Crucible, the JRTC experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash linktr dot e e forward slash jrtc we'd like to thank our partners at the center for army lessons learned of the combined arms center especially the jrtc call observations detachment be sure to follow them on social media as well follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www dot army dot mil forward slash C-A-L-L. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts. And be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future. The Crucible, the JRTC experience, is a product of the Joint Readiness Training Center.